Dr. Bika, you may proceed. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you for joining us this evening. I think we'll just give it a few more minutes before we get some more participants to join in. I hope one and all are keeping nice and warm in this cold weather. A warm welcome again to one and all who have just joined us. Um, welcome to another webinar um, in collaboration with the Young Dentist Council and uh, the South African Dental Association. Um, the, the Young Dental Council is a council under the, the wing of the South African Dental Association. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a, a, a guest, Dr. Yusuf Jadwit, and um, before I introduce our speaker, I would just like to um, run through some house rules. So um, before I call upon our speaker, so ladies and gentlemen, um, there'll be a question and answer session at the end of the session. So please uh, uh, from using your rate, the raised hand option, but instead use the Q&A tab uh, at the bottom of, of the panel. Uh, there will be CPD certificates available and loaded onto the SADA platform on the portal. So if you are not a SADA member, you can go onto the portal and create a profile for yourself to access the CPD certificates. This evening qualifies you for one clinical CEU point. We are also streaming live on YouTube. So if you, um, if you haven't registered or if you know your friends, some of your friends or colleagues that haven't registered and you'd like to send them the link, it is on the SADA uh, YouTube channel. So you may just share the link or direct them towards that place. Or at a later stage, if you feel that you need to refer back to this, this webinar, it will be available on our YouTube channel. I would like to also just mention some of our upcoming webinars. So a big event is the SADA Dental and Oral Health Virtual Congress, which will be taking place from the 27th till the 29th of August. And the theme is back to the basics, excellence in dentistry. And our registration opens on the 1st of July. So it's a, it's a program over three days full of packed international and local speakers and from the comfort of your home. So please um, don't miss out on this opportunity. Then on the 24th of June, we have a webinar called Dental Care by Barry Raphael from the USA. Uh, why wait, is it too late? That is part of our uh, Great Awakening series. On the 29th of June, there's uh, a webinar on GEMS by Mr. Ishmael Mohapi, the impact of fraud, waste and abuse on medical aid schemes. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now introduce our speaker for this evening, he's Dr. Yusuf Jadwit. He's well known all over South Africa and internationally. Um, I'll take a lot of time if I were to read his whole uh, CV. So just quick and short, Dr. Jadwit practices as a specialist in oral medicine and periodontology at his private practice in Melrose, uh, Melrose North in Johannesburg. He's also currently studying part-time for the SLP program at Harvard Medical School. Um, he has also been part and has published a number of scientific articles covering various topics in this discipline. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me welcome Dr. Yusuf Jadwit. Um, Dr. Yusuf Jadwit, 
Your topic today is peri the periodontal patient, what am I looking for? So the floor is over to you. Uh, Dr. Jadwood, you may just unmute your, your mic. Now am I loud and clear? <laughs> yes, Dr. Jadwood. The floor Good is yours and I can, I can see your presentation. So, yes. Fantastic. Well, good evening to all. And I'm sure we're all nice and cozy at home after the cold weather we've had over the last few weeks. So I'm not going to delay any longer and we're going to start with today's presentation. The last year has been very interesting for all of us. And with most world-changing events, like pandemics, our daily routines have been changed greatly. We have changed our Friday night out at the favorite restaurant to maybe staying at home and ordering out, or we may stay at home and make it a family occasion where everybody gets together and makes the, fa the favorite Friday evening dish. And we do all of this in order to keep ourselves safe, to keep our families safe, our staff safe, our patients safe, and everyone around us safe. And in the similar way, our patients also have their own set of essentials that they think that are important to them. Unfortunate thing is that dental intervention is not always considered a priority. And this is alarming because most of the time patients would seek treatment when they're in pain. But this is not the case with periodontitis. In fact, in the early stages, there's no real symptoms whatsoever. This mindset about seeking treatment when in pain is a problem for us, uh, especially when it comes to managing periodontitis, because we do know that early diagnosis and detection makes a big difference in the long term. You get better outcomes, the use of less resources, less cost to the patient, and better patient acceptance of treatment plans because they are far simpler and less complicated. We at our practice have in the last few months seen an obvious increase in the number of patients presenting with severe forms of periodontitis. And to some degree, it's very understandable. Patients are highly stressed out due to the added pressures of the pandemic, and this can have an impact on our patients. Tonight, we are gonna explore the part taken in managing patients with periodontitis. And in the process, I do hope that you may pick up a few tips that may be of value to you in your daily practice, um, wherever you may be. So we're going to go through a few things. We're going to start with what is chronic disease, and then we're going to go on to a quick pathogenesis of periodontitis, followed by gingival health, uh, the need for an, uh, a comprehensive assessment plan, the tools of the trade, and finally, what kind of treatment we have available for our patients. Sorry, I've got a small problem trying to move on to the next slide. Please do bear with me. I do apologize. Okay. So, there is a marked difference in how you would manage patients who present with chronic diseases compared to those that have acute conditions. So a simple example would be a patient walking down the street, uh, he trips or she trips on a loose pavement brick, falls down and maybe fractures or chips a tooth. They get themselves off to the dentist, uh, sit there, get the filling done and they're on the way back home. All they already had to do was get themselves to the dentist and the rest was carried out by the dentist. When it comes to chronic care, things are very, very different. Getting to the dentist is step one. Half the job is actually done at the dental surgery and the other half is done at home. So in order to get a good outcome at the end, both parties, the dental practice and, and, his, and his associate uh, practitioners, as well as the patient, need to do their half of what is required to get a decent outcome at the end. Therefore, it becomes very, very important to develop a rapport with your patients. This helps to better understand who your patient is. It also helps to then plan a better treatment plan that would suit the patient and it would have a greater acceptance level, okay? 
Education is fundamental for any kind of chronic disease. The more the patient understands, the easier it becomes for all of us to motivate the patient. Also, it helps the compliance as well. When it comes to patient education, I find, especially in our practice, the best kind of education is during contact time and when I interact with my patients. And usually uh, other forms that I use uh, between these interactions can be printed articles, which we may email on, on occasion to our patients. It could be pictures that I send to my patients, or we could uh, provide them with certain websites that may be of interest to themselves. But collectively, all this goes into educating the patient and providing that support of understanding as to what's going on. Like with any chronic condition, we are responsible to some degree as to what we do at home. Uh, it is important that you enable the patient to take care of their own health. There are times when patients walk into my rooms and say, doc, I'm willing to come every second month for cleaning. Uh, usually I become very apprehensive You've got to be very careful when patients try to pass on the health responsibilities to you. Remember, ultimately, the health of the patient is in their hands and it's not really your responsibility. Right? There are times as well that patients may present with a smoking habit or mental health problems, and you may need the assistance of other therapists. So the team gets bigger in trying to manage this patient with chronic disease. And believe you me, most often all the patient wants is to sit down and have someone listen to them. And this we do very, very well with our support staff at the office. With any kind of chronic management, maintenance is very, very important. Supportive periodontal therapy is what's required in order to maintain the, the, the achievements gained in the first phase, which is the initial phase, and the second phase, which is the surgical phase. Uh, these are active treatment phases, and you want to maintain the, the, the achievements or the progress made going forward. And you can only do this by a good, well-planned maintenance program, or as it comes to uh, periodontal, uh, periodontitis, uh, management rather supportive periodontal therapy. Now, in most cases, things don't just develop out of the blue. And the similar thing happens when it comes to gingivitis or, or other periodontitis. It, periodontitis usually starts as gingivitis, which is a mildest, mildest form of disease. The gums can become red, they may get swollen, they may even bleed easily, right? But at this time, there's little or no discomfort at this stage. Gingivitis, is often caused by inadequate plaque control and is reversible with professional treatment and good self-performed plaque control at home. Factors that may contribute additionally to gingivitis would include diabetes, smoking, aging, genetic problems, systemic diseases and conditions, and a whole host of medications that can lead to dry mouth and aggravate uh, gingivitis. And the list goes on and on and on. Right. If left untreated, gingivitis can advance to periodontitis. A plaque thickens, toxins produced by the bacteria living within this biofilm results in gingival irritation, and eventually a chronic inflammatory response is uh, stimulated. So what does this mean? It basically means that the body is essentially turning on itself, leading to destruction of both hard and soft tissues. Eventually, pockets will form, and given sufficient time, these pockets will deepen, and more hard and soft tissues will be destroyed. Again, symptoms may not be that severe, and in most cases, they may just be mild symptoms which the patient begins to live with. Eventually, with time, the unfortunate happens, and teeth have become loose, and they may have to be removed. And the same thing happens around implants as well. So I'm, I'm making a point of mentioning implants because on many occasions, I have patients coming to my rooms wanting dental implant to replace missing teeth, but they tend to overlook the need to have the foundation stabilized, meaning to have the periodontitis managed before we can have implants. Uh, implants will always be the cherry on the top. When it comes to managing patients who have periodontitis, 
Step one would be to remove infection. Step two would be to improve function. And finally, step three would be to improve the aesthetics. And usually uh, these three steps are not always carried out by one person and may require a team effort. Now, we've spoken about how chronic disease is managed, especially when it's regards to periodontitis. I've given you a broad idea as to how uh, gingivitis would eventually progress to periodontitis and eventually lead to tooth loss or implant loss, depending on the situation. Now, having all this information on hand, what do we need to look for when we are doing a clinical examination? What do healthy gums look like? And believe you me, the picture you see up there on the screen where uh, adjacent to the healthy gum area, is a picture taken from one of my patients. And just to point out what dedication and, and, and attention to detail can do. So this patient has healthy gums. What do they look like? They are firm, they are pink, they fit snugly around the tooth. And you can see quite nicely around this, the, 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 the lateral incisor and, and, and the, apologies, the lateral incisor and as well as the central incisor. You've got this flat, papilla knifed edge margins and the snug fit of the gingiva around the teeth. So what qualifies as unhealthy gums if this is what healthy gums look like? Well, on most instances, unhealthy gums may be puffy, they usually bright red, they may bleed easily, and they can be very tender to touch. Some signs of unhealthy gums uh, are, are obvious, the patient walks into a room, you can see all this redness. And at times when patients have a thick gingival architecture and it's not that obvious. So therefore a proper interoral examination is vital to come to a diagnosis. Factors that can undermine healthy gums, once again, includes things like tobacco use, malnutrition, poor plaque control, which has been mentioned earlier on, poor immunity, and again, a list of medications that can cause dry mouth and eventually promote gum disease. On occasion, you may find a bit of pus around the teeth, right? Gum disease, unfortunately, attacks the bone that holds our teeth in position. And as a result, the teeth or dental implants may become loose or mobile. Periodontitis is the main cause of the change in the way our teeth fit together as well. Your mouth is a nice, warm, and wet area, and it's home to billions of bacteria. The periodontal pathogens love the sulfur environment, and they produce this as a byproduct in which they thrive. And this is what the foul odor uh, originates from. So that smell that we get when patients walk in with periodontitis, rather, or the woof on the floss after flossing the posterior teeth is probably as a result of salsa production by the perio pathogens. Sensitive teeth and pain on chewing are other factors that one needs to consider rather when we're looking at unhealthy gums. Uh, sensitive teeth as a result of what? So once you've, once you've got destruction of hard and soft tissue, you would ultimately get we see recession or receding of the gums. And this recession of the gums would lead to exposure of the root part of the tooth. Now, as we all know, the crown is covered by enamel and this is a protective structure that keeps the pain away. Beneath the enamel, we have dentine. Dentine by its very nature is tubular in structure and it has fluid full tubules, but eventually a fluctuate and can then lead to a sensation. Now, when we go to the root area, there is no enamel. We have a very thin layer of cementum, which can very easily be brushed off. And once the dentine becomes exposed, the teeth do become sensitive. So another huge problem we experience when patients are present, uh, present with uh, ginger, uh, periodontitis is an increased level of sensitivity. Yeah? It's also to important to remember that healthy gums aren't just important for your oral health but more important for your overall health. There are multiple studies out there that have shown an association between periodontitis 
and other more serious conditions like diabetes, for example, and heart disease. To start off, we need a comprehensive periodontal evaluation. It is important. And this comprehensive periodontal evaluation includes what? Multiple factors. Uh, we, we disc, uh, disease progression. We determine the cause of, of, of action, what kind of treatment plan that we can come up with. And therefore, it becomes vital that we need to have some sort of standardized idea or standardized plan when we're doing uh, a comprehensive evaluation. And more importantly is that everyone that's responsible or every, every clinician in the practice needs to understand how this works. Periodontal disease is actually very, very common, the, the plaque induced periodontitis. And if left untreated, like we said earlier on, it can lead to bleeding gums, bad breath, or possibly tooth loss. Now, according, according to research done by the American Association of Periodontology, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, up to half of the US adults above the age of 30 and older have some form of periodontal disease. That's a huge number of people with potential disabilities as they get older. So what's a disability? Loss of teeth. What happens then? Then we need to do either prosthesis or dental implants to get them back to where they were in a functional and aesthetic uh, uh, manner. On its own, periodontitis may not seem like much, but like we said earlier on, once again, it is linked to some serious other conditions, such as diabetes, heart disease, as well as Alzheimer's. And this makes diagnosing and managing of periodontitis an important part of our daily activities in our practices. And in most instances, uh, patients would first seek treatment by the daily general dental practice, the practitioner rather, uh, instead of going straight to the periodont periodontist. So please guys, it's important, take the time, do a screening at the very, very least. It will make a massive difference in the long term, right? In terms of our current situation, preventing or preventing the worsening of periodontal disease is absolutely crucial in the midst of this global COVID-19 pandemic, which also triggers an inflammatory response. So when, when, when I first heard about COVID-19 and this cytokine storm and inflammatory response, my first, my first thought process was, hang on, I've heard this before. And, and unfortunately, it's exactly what happens in periodontal disease, or periodontitis. You've got this massive inflammatory response. It has an impact on, on your cardiovascular system. It can cause an increase in strokes, uh, narrowing of your arteries. It has an impact on uh, women of childbearing age. It can lead to preterm birth, low birth weight babies. So it's not something that we should just take lightly. We're looking at holistic care, okay? So, New research uh, has found, uh, going back to what I was saying earlier on regarding COVID-19, new research has found, this was done uh, between May and June last year using electronic uh, hospital records in Qatar. And they looked at patients uh, who were uh, in the hospital and there were patients who were either have died in ICU admissions or assisted ventilation. This is one group of patients. And the other group or the con control group were patients with COVID-19 but who were discharged without any major complications. And out of the 568 patients studied, those with periodontitis were at least three times more likely to experience COVID-19 complications, which would include that ICU admission and the need for assisted ventilation. In addition to this, COVID-19 patients with periodontitis showed increased levels of biomarkers associated with worsened disease outcomes, which would include white blood cell increases and an increase in C-reactive proteins. So it becomes fundamental, guys. What we're trying to say is that we are missing the large majority of our patients who present with disease. Uh, I mentioned in my opening statement that we are seeing patients or we're seeing an, uh, an obvious increase in patients presenting with severe disease. Periodontitis is not something that would start yesterday or last week or last month. It takes a while to develop. And I beg of you guys out there, get a decent probe, 
when you're doing your, your general dental assessment, do a periodontal screening at the very, very least to determine whether this patient is safe or whether this patient needs some sort of, some sort of intervention. The early four millimeter pockets are the best ones to treat. It requires minimal intervention. Probably does not require any intervention from asbestos because most of us out there are comfortable and capable to manage periodontal disease or periodontitis in its initial phase. So what does a comprehensive dental or periodontal evaluation entail? Well, it includes the assessment of teeth, dental implants, as well as subgingival areas. Discussions used, well, you've got the assessment and then you have discussions. And these normally kind of go around the nature of disease, the risk factors associated with disease, the impact of periodontal disease on other systems, and roughly a roadmap about what's required going forward. Look, it's chronic disease. It's taken years to get to this point. You can't turn this patient around overnight. It will take a while. And if something is gonna take a while and requires more than one point, then patients are concerned. They're concerned because it's time, they're concerned because it's cost, and they gotta have some idea of where the starting goal is and where the end goal is. Now, it's, it's not as simple as that because sometimes there's never an end goal. Uh, with regard to getting to total stability, we have patients with recurrent disease. And later on in today's uh, or this evening's lecture or presentation, we're going to go through a few case studies and, uh, which have recurrent problems associated, and we're going to discuss how we manage these things. But that, that's for, for later on tonight. Right? So what does it involve? Our starting point, a comprehensive medical history to learn if there are certain risk factors or conditions that may affect or, or, or lead to furthering of gingival disease, right? Next comes an oral examination. And we are looking for the usual signs mentioned earlier on. We've been looking for healthy gingiva or healthy gums and unhealthy gums. During the exam, the pocket depths are measured to check for deep pockets. And if there's significant depth in the, uh, depth in the pockets, x-rays need, are needed. Uh, to look further into the severity of periodontitis. So what we're looking at, if the patient has walked into the rooms, we've got our chart out, and just, just for information purposes, the chart that you see on your screen on the top right -hand side or on the right-hand side has been downloaded from uh, the University of, University of Bern's website. If you navigate to the period department page, uh, you can find this. In fact, it's quite nice because you can actually fill this online and print it out. Personally, I do find this a bit cumbersome. It's just too busy for me. Most of us have patient management systems uh, in our offices, and many of these come with their own version of periodontal evaluation chart. So there's another option for you. And if all this fails and you're not winning, my suggestion is maybe contact your previous period department. And I'm more than certain that they'd be very willing to help or, or assist in providing a periodontal evaluation chart, which you can uh, very easily use in your rooms. Now, once, we, once we've gone through the, the, the assessments, we also got to look for the presence of mark because that is an important factor when it comes to managing periodontitis. We can control the amount of plaque. We can, to some degree, control our stress level. Certain things we can't. Genetics cannot be controlled. That's how it is and that's how it will be. So a note is made of the presence of plaque, the distribution of plaque, and in a similar way, a calculus is included with this. The comprehensive exam does not end with us recording period-related measurements, but includes assessment of teeth as well. Right? So what are we looking for when you're doing the assessment? We are looking for dental caries, uh, which can be quite often. We find them on, on the root areas of exposed uh, roots, especially in older patients with dry mouths. What about interproximal contacts? Many a case, they have open contacts or they have poor contacts, and these become food traps. We also check the vitality of teeth because we want to determine whether the, the lesions are perioendo or endoperio lesions. 
And then what about restorations? And this is a common issue that we pick up uh, during routine x-rays as well. We have open margins, we have overhangs, and even though these may seem insignificant in the greater scheme of things, what patient with periodontitis is a massive letdown. We need to correct these things. By correcting these things, we are making it easier for patients to clean the teeth, but we're also minimizing the niche areas where bacteria or pathogens can colonize and cause further problems. Over and above this, we then look at the mobility of teeth, you know, uh, whether it's a grade one, a grade two, or grade three. We also look at mobility of dental implants. A mobile dental implant is a failed implant that needs to be removed. Why is mobility important? Well, it gives us an idea as to the integrity or the longevity of teeth as well. And we, we, we've got to be able to determine what is physiologic movement and pathologic movement. And this is where radiographs play a huge role. So a widened periodontal ligament with a mobile tooth could indicate pathologic movement. But movement of a tooth with no change in the ligament space would be categorized as normal physiologic movement. X-rays or radiographs become important when we're trying to assess bone loss patterns. We're trying to figure out the quality or quantity of bone. It is an invaluable tool to use uh, when we're trying to work on our treatment plans for patients, when we're trying to plan what to do, we need good quality X-rays. And then what about the risk factors? We do quite uh, clearly know, understand that as one gets older, there is an obvious, or there is a risk of increased severe, severity of disease. The incidence increases as we get older as well. Diabetes is one of the few conditions where it's a two-way street. By improving your diabetic condition, you can actually indirectly improve your, your periodontitis and vice versa. And believe you me, we have seen these things in our practice. I have patients who've come in by diabetic and, and the, the master mess. Uh, we've got to take our teeth, clean everything out. And strangely enough, once we start to stabilize them, many a time I've been told, but doc, my insulin needs to be reduced or the amount of medication that we've taken needs to be reduced. Most of the time, it may be for a few months, uh, I haven't had a patient where, it, where it's a long-term thing, but we do see the obvious change when we improve the periodontal health of our patients. What about smoking? It's a huge no-no when it comes to periodontitis. And as much as we would love to say, yes, go ahead, it's not going to cause harm, smoking really messes up treatment. In fact, so much so, if you read some of the articles, the, the final outcomes in a smoker compared to a non-smoker is about 50%, which means that you're paying this 100% bill, but you're only walking out with 50% of the outcomes, which is, which is really not a good idea. So you need to work on the smoking. And if you can't do it in-house with regard to support and, and, and some sort of advice, then my suggestion is please try and get uh, outside help and support for your patient. It does make a massive difference for those patients who have periodontitis and smoke to stop smoking. It makes, a fen it makes a phenomenal distance. What about cardiovascular disease? Another major issue, you're well aware, I mentioned earlier on about the inflammatory response that is triggered by uh, periodontitis. Uh, I mentioned also earlier that there's an increased risk of strokes in, in, uh, in patients with periodontitis. So we've got to be careful about these things. And then there's a whole lot of other little bits and pieces which we can look into, which has an impact on uh, periodontal health. What is it? Uh, uh, what are the other risk factors? Hormonal changes, recreational drugs. What about obesity? It's also a factor. Inadequate nutrition, genetics, and again, the ever favored medication. So we have a full understanding of what, require, what is required to manage chronic disease. We have a kind of an understanding of how gingivitis has progressed to periodontitis and eventually to tooth loss. We also know pretty well that we need to do a comprehensive examination. And all this information has been, has been kind of 
filtered and used. And now we are ready to treat our patient. The treatment plan is in place, the patient has been informed and the light is green and we're good to go. The kind of tools that we use are important. Strangely enough, for periodontal management, especially for initial phase of periodontal management, you don't need the most expensive tools out there. You don't need to go and break the bank and buy really expensive stuff. You need a good working probe, like the one you see in the middle picture on your screen. It's a 15 millimeter probe. The markings are very, very clearly defined. So it's easy to calculate proper depths. And as you can see, the dark lines are five millimeter intervals. So it goes up to 15 mils. What about plaque disclosing solution? This is an invaluable tool. I have patients that walk into my room and the duck, you know, I've brushed and I've done everything else. And then we go and stain their teeth. And what do you see? Stain all over the shore. What I'm fond of is a two-tone stain. It tells me where there's new plaque and tells me where there's old plaque. So you can decide now whether the patient has just had a bad morning and done a terrible job in cleaning their teeth, or whether this has been a consistent thing over a period of time. It's also very useful to educate your patients. Strangely enough, you'll find that it's the same areas all the time that become colonized or, become, or have plaque accumulation in them. A slightly rotated tooth, a little space between the teeth. These are big, uh, areas that will trap plaque, but will make cleaning difficult. So it's important to take note of these things. And like we do on occasion, we take a picture of the patient's teeth and show it to them. So yes, doc, I clean well and I do everything, but no, you're not doing it and we need to modify. But remember, this is not meant to criticize the patient. It is meant to aid the patient or to guide them to where the dirt is so they can clean more effectively. Some patients find this very, very insulting and they, they feel they personally, oh, wow, look at my mouth. It's not meant to be that. What about our ultrasonic scalar tips? We are fortunate in today's world. We have a whole range of scalar tips out there uh, available to us. It's important that we use the right stuff. Myself, while I'm busy doing a root planning, I may change a tip or two, depending on what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, look, it's important to understand, you can't stick a thick periodontal tip into a periodontal pocket. It may be okay in the initial phase of therapy, but once you've removed the information and there's still a pocket there, you wanna go back, the skin is firm, it's tight around the tooth, you are going to cause damage. There's a variety of tips there, out, out, out there. Take your time, look what's available, look what you need, and maybe get a few of them just for your patients with periodontitis. When it comes to curettes, the age-old curettes, I am still a bit of an old-school person, and I truly like to use my curettes, even though I have used ultrasonic scalar with the fancy tips before that. It just gives me a little bit more information. I find that I can hear with, with the curettes. So if it's a rough surface, the sound is different. I can feel with the curettes. So if I've missed something with my ultrasonic scalar and I go with my, with my curette, I can feel the bump of calculus. Not, not if it's totally, totally flat, but most of the time you can feel this. And granulation tissue, I get far more granulation tissue out with curettes than I do with my ultrasonic scalars. Importantly to note, is that you need to have sharp instruments. A blunt curette may very well burnish the calculus flat, and you've done nothing to clean the area out. Now, if you look at the screen, we've got two, four, five pictures, and we've got a little blank spot on the top right-hand side of the screen. And there's a reason for that, because with all these tools available, we all greatly lack one, two. Anyone's guess? Well, it's time. It cannot be rushed. Periodontal management requires time. It requires time when it comes to educating the patient. It requires time when you're debriding around the, the teeth. And it requires time for the patient to heal. You cannot rush this. It is not an afterthought. Chronic disease cannot be managed quickly. Please, guys, take time. Put time aside. 
you need to chat to your, to your patients. They need to understand what's going on. You cannot rush this. Okay. So we're now coming to important parts. Uh, parts that I would gather relate to your daily clinical practice. Okay. What does it mean to treat gum disease? What can we do to improve the patient's health? What are our options? Right. Many a time a patient would walk in and say, Doc, I have read this article in the paper. Can you do this? Doc, there's this new uh, medication out or new tool out. Do you do this? And unfortunately, we have to work very hard against the marketing companies out there. When it comes to managing uh, periodontitis, we have two basic categories, non-surgical and surgical treatment. So scaling, we're all aware of. It's something we started as young uh, undergrad uh, students, uh, and then eventually we went on to fillings and so on and so forth. And it's something that we would do on a daily basis in our practices. You can't do a scaling in 10 minutes. You need time for this. Once you're done with the scaling, it's important that you make sure you've removed all the calculus. There are times when I... You can't see that well. The patient may have bleeding gums or the water and the blood and everything else. It's just so difficult to see. Always get the help of the dental nurse or dental assistant. From their angle, can they see something that you may have missed? And once you're done, please go over and make sure you've removed all the debris above the gingival, above the, the tissues. Root planing, it is an important part of managing treatment. Why is it important? What's the goal of root planning? Why are we doing all of this? We're not removing disease. What we are doing though, is we're removing bacteria, which can cause disease. We're removing irritants, which can cause disease. And in the root planning, right, is fundamental. Again, we're going back to a step process, remove infection first, then improve uh, uh, function, and then aesthetics. The remove infection part, requires better debridement. Leaving bits of calculus behind is not gonna help anyone. It really comes back and bites you down the line. So guys, when you are root planning, take your time. You can't do this in five minutes. You can't do this in 10 minutes. Uh, it takes a long time. And when you're done, be comfortable with the fact that if you, we have to go to the next phase, which is a surgical phase if needed, and you open everything up, you're not going to see chunks of, of calculus around your teeth or, deb or debris around the teeth. That is another half an hour to clean out. You want to make sure that each step that you do, you do absolutely well. What about counseling? I mentioned earlier on that we may need extended people in our teams to help people with tobacco use, uh, tobacco abuse rather. How many of us spend time talking to our patients and discussing plaque control. My discussion with our patients lasts about 20 minutes. Plaque control is, is fundamental, it is half the job. And unfortunately, if you go back to the way we are taught periodont uh, uh, periodontal management, it was coming to the clinic, you have a culture, root plane, scalar polish, do a comprehensive exam, and you get a culture, and the, pa the patient is fixed. Patient cannot be fixed just by that. It's not a filling. It's not a crown with a broken tooth uh, underneath that. It requires the patient to go home and do their part and do their part really, really well. So when it comes to blood control, we've got to look at simple ways of explaining to our patients on how to keep their teeth clean. The most common reason, I, uh, the most common thing I have with patients is that Doc, I use a hard toothbrush, and no, I cannot brush gently. And I, I hear this, and I sit back, and I think, something makes no sense. If you put your mind to something, you definitely can do it. So I normally start off by asking my patients if they own a car. And most of them are embarrassed because everybody owns a car, but they generally don't drive fancy cars. And now I said, okay, fine. So if we had a massive rainstorm last night, and you're driving out of my uh, the, the practice yard, and you turn up the road and you drive over this puddle. And oops, you realize it's not a puddle, but rather a pothole. And if you've got to come back the following day to my office 
and you're driving up the same road again following treatment, what would you do? The response is, I would drive around the pothole because now I know it's a pothole. That is a conscious decision. And if you can make that kind of conscious decision, you can make a conscious decision in order not to brush hard. So we've got to find ways of explaining to our patients in terms that they can understand that it is possible. Uh, the other common thing, uh, I love cars. So I always use cars to explain things to our patients because everybody understands cars. So when it comes to brushing techniques, my, my opening line is the tube brush does three things, which are it cleans the driver's side of the car, it cleans the roof of the car, and it cleans the passenger side of the car. That's all the toothbrush does. Your bonnet, your boot, and your bumpers need a different tool. And if you think about it, you're not going to really use the same rag or brush to clean your, your bumpers that you would use on the, on the bodywork on the driver, passenger, driver side, passenger side, and roof. You're going to use something else. So already in our daily lives, we are learning to adapt in order to get things nice and clean. It's just thinking about what we're doing and realizing whether we do it in our mouth or whether we do it on our fancy motor car, the logic still remains the same. And then to scale our patients even further, we have found currently about 700 uh, different species of bugs that live in our mouth. And each species is a few million to billion in number. So when we talk about effective plaque removal, that's what we mean. A millimeter cube of plaque contains around a billion bacteria. That's a tremendous amount of cockles floating around in our mouth. So most patients say, Doc, you know, I haven't got time to floss, or it's, it's annoying to clean in between my teeth. Then I go about and I explain to them the stats. The combined surface areas it combines surface interproximal areas, about 40% of all the surfaces. So by you not attempting to clean in between, you've already left out 40% of your surfaces. Over and above that, I don't know anyone who can clean 100% when they do clean. So 40% is not clean, and the rest that you are cleaning, you see you're really good at what you do. You probably clean say about 50% of that. So we're still sitting with a 50% clean mouth and a 50% unclean mouth. So please guys, take your time when it comes to explaining to your patients exactly what is required. And what about the tools that we use? Uh, what kind of toothbrush does the patient need to, uh, need to use? Have you sat down and spoken to your patients? Have you actually tried doing what you've told your patients, brushing circular motions, spend so much of time, what we do in the office is if there is a new product on the market, we all try it out. And we all try it out for a good few months. And then we have an idea about how things work. My staff give me feedback. I uh, give myself feedback as to what I think works. So that when we do, uh, or if we do uh, suggest a product to our, pa to our patients, we understand the shortcomings. We understand where the issues are. We also have an idea of how long this brush will last. So if a patient walks into a room that says, doc, you know, this thing is rubbish. I use it for the last four weeks and look how it looks. I can very, uh, I mean, very confidently tell him you're brushing too hard. So understand the products that you use. And the most important thing, don't sell the cheap brush of the week to the patient. You're better off trying to get something that works. And if the patient has spent a few more uh, rants or cents on that, they better off. Moving from one cheap product to the next cheap product can be detrimental. Having said that, it does not mean you're going to spend a vast amount of money to clean your teeth correctly. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to tobacco counseling. We've had a huge issue when it comes to smoking. And my in house survey over the, the last year and a half uh, with the COVID-19 lockdown, also with the ban on, on, on cigarette smoking, what we found in the office is none of our patients who do smoke have to smoke it. In fact, they are smoking more than ever and they're smoking a lot of rubbish as well. Uh, well, during the lockdown when there was a ban, they all went on to this uh, cheap stuff. So we need, to, uh, we need to get the message across to our patients that we need to manage this. We need to manage this immediately. 
you will see a definite change in patients once they stop the tobacco use. Please, guys, it is important. Take your time, sit down with the patient, and motivate them to work on the smoking. Mental health issues are a huge factor as well. Uh, people who are depressed, they have they lack motivation. They don't really want to wake up in the morning and take a bath or brush their teeth. And these people do need help because without getting them to a point where they feel comfortable, where they feel confident, and where they feel alive, you're actually wasting our time trying to, trying to get them to clean their teeth properly. Okay, so that's all about the non-surgical part. Like I said, please do spend the time, uh, sit down with the patient when you come to block control techniques uh, and what to, to do and how to do it. We, we generally do uh, try to keep things simple for our patients. We, they do have a life. They, they need to get up in the morning. They need to go to work. And they really can't spend the whole day cleaning the AT. So whatever you suggest to your patients, it has to be practical, first of all, and it has to be doable by the patient as well. You, you wouldn't want someone doing something for a day, two days, three days, maybe a week, and then stop. What you want is to understand why they're doing, what they're doing, and continue doing it for the rest of the lives. So I'm going back, my apologies. What does that mean, block control? Why would they have to do it for the rest of their lives? And what would motivate them? So we sit down and have a little biology chat. I explain to them, look, when you brush your teeth, there's a little electric charge on your tooth surface, which changes. And then when you're done, You've got this clean surface with a charge on it. That little charge would then attract proteins from your saliva. And it's like painting a wall. So if you want the paint to stick, you first put the primer on the wall, and then the paint will stick. So this little protein layer that forms on the surface of the teeth is priming the tooth surface. And by priming the tooth surface, it's now ready to accept bacterial colonization or bacterial attachment on the surface. And depending on the kind of food you eat and, and how much of, of energy you're going to provide to this bacteria, you know, there's a rich source of energy, they're going to flourish and they're going to multiply rapidly. If it's slightly less, it's not going to be as quick, but they will form a plug layer. And as this layer of plug thickens, different species start to attach. Because as I told you earlier on, we have found so far about 700 different species of plugs in a little bit of our mouth. They got this evolution of, of plug. It's very much like the first little uh, person, the uh, first person arriving in a, in, in a little bushy area and set up a little home. And after a couple of weeks, a few more other people arrive. After a couple of months, you've got now fixed structures. Eventually, you've got roads and um, sewage and electricity. And it's exactly what's happening in the plant biofilm. The environment is changing. And as the environment changes, it makes it more ideal for other species to become part of this. So what does it mean when we say we're cleaning our teeth? Why do we clean our teeth? Do we clean our teeth to make it whiter? Do we clean our teeth to make it shinier? No, we clean our teeth so that we can disturb the plaque. And by disturbing the plaque, we are preventing the progression of one species to the other. But each time you go in there and you brush everything off, it's going to start all over again. And by doing this, we're actually preventing disease from taking hold in our mouth. So this is a nice way to explain to your patients why it's important to maintain good blood control, not to have shiny white teeth, but to have healthy teeth and gums. So the second part of uh, treatment is a surgical part of treatment. And there are times where Non-surgical intervention is just not enough. And there are times where surgical intervention can actually be beneficial to the patient. Surgical intervention has evolved over the last number of years. If you go back to a good few decades ago, it was quite disruptive. Uh, the, the theory was remove all disease tissue. So go in there and cut the soft tissue, cut the bone, and everything is thrown out. And that's not practical. And that's not how we work today either. Today, it's more about conservation, preserving and building on what you have. So our procedures or surgical procedures are kind of designed to protect, but also eliminate disease. So the most simple form of, of surgical intervention would be an open flap debridement, where the, the soft tissue is kind of removed from the surface of the teeth and a few millimeters of bone. 
they have direct access to the surface of the tooth as well as the surface of the bone. And we can clean all of this out, remove all the debris and put it back together. With time, uh, regeneration has taken hold. And again, we have a whole range of materials that we can use when it comes to regeneration. So if you just kind of look in, uh, at, at some of the products available in South Africa, about 10 to 15 years ago, they were quite limited. Today, there's a whole range of bone products available, from synthetic to bovine to cadaver, and the list is endless. Uh, these things will actually make a difference when it comes to building up areas that have broken down. Understand this as much. You can't regenerate every area and every site. Certain sites are more giving uh, compared to other sites, or they're more accepting compared to other sites. Uh, a three-wall defect is an ideal defect to, to uh, graft. A one-wall defect, not so much so. So our understanding of the basics of periodontology, uh, our understanding of what happens, fits in, in with the kind of treatment that we're planning to do. What about the patients that walk in verification defect on an upper molar, for example? And we do see them on occasion, and, and every now and then it works out quite sweetly. So uh, a deprecation defect on, on the six, for example, uh, one could go in there and do a root resection, remove the distal root, for example. This gives you access to the patient area without jeopardizing integrity of the tooth too much. Obviously, I'm saying this, uh, with, the, with the assumption that you've assessed the roots and assessed everything else to make sure it's a healthy tooth and it can withstand the root canal treatment and the root resection. And then what about tooth replacement? That's becoming an important thing. Today we are living longer. We want a more functional life. We want to enjoy the food that we have and we actually want to look good. And I think that's the motivating factor, to look good. There are a number of tooth replacement options out there. When I say a number, we actually have three. One of them is a, a removal option when it comes to dentures, whether they're metal or plastic. I, I am not a huge fan of acrylic dentures. They come strippers and I don't like them. A bridge, well, that's an option. And then finally, a dental implant. This is what we, I will focus more on rather than a bridge because I don't do bridges in my practice. Why well, dental implants? When considering dental implant, it becomes important to understand when the implant needs to be replaced. If there's disease, and it's important, if there's disease, you cannot place a dental implant in the mouth. You first need to manage the disease. Bacterial colonization, which can cause bone loss around tooth, can cause bone loss around an implant as well. Unfortunate thing, an implant is a thread, which means as soon as it becomes contaminated, the hojas tend to work themselves around the screw, and eventually you will end up with implant loss. Not only implant loss, but you end up with a massive amount of bone loss as well. So planning your implant placement requires a bit of thought process, requires a healthy, healthy, healthy foundation. The next time you get an implant, please take out the probe do a general assessment at the very, very least, to ensure your patient is healthy before the implant is placed in there. All right, so like I promised, I want to go through a few, uh, a, few a couple uh, of, of cases that we've been seeing for a while. The first case is of a patient who we started seeing in 2015. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite a long time ago. It's basically a case of a full natural dentition. And if you look at, and these are the charts, by the way, that we use, the one on the top left-hand side, this is come, it comes with my software. And it's pretty straightforward, simple, and easy to understand. So the first two, the first two categories on the top would be the upper jaw or the first two lines, uh, um, pointing them out to you now, upper jaw, and then the bottom two would be lower jaw, and then these little squares in the bottom would be upper and lower, indicating presence of plaque and bleeding. And this is how the patient presented with a terribly uh, involved mouth, plaque everywhere, bleeding all over the shore, and a number of severe signs. So the red indicates probing depths of more than five millimeters. The yellow would indicate probing depths of four and five, and anything less 
and four, uh, between zero and three millimeters, is indicated by the black triangles in the hexagon. So each little hexagon on this chart represents a tooth with three triangles in the outer half and three on the inner half, representing the outer surfaces and the inner surfaces. But this is how we started with this patient, a bit of a mess. And we've been following this patient through for a number of years. And as you can see, the patient walked in with the, in the, in the, for his initial comprehensive examination, following which a treatment plan was done. And then thereafter, we, we started with the initial phase, which involved straightforward root planning, scaling, root planning, and plot control. So the first screening, the first uh, periodontal chart you see on the top left-hand side, this is how he presented after initial phase therapy. And there's a drastic improvement. If you look at the, the depth of the pockets, the number of deep pockets uh, or severe pockets has decreased tremendously. Uh, the plaque has improved somewhat. The bleeding, eh, not so great. Step two, we then took him on to the surgical phase. And here as well, we did not do any heroics. Straightforward, open, flap, you bribe me. That's all we did. The patient was a younger patient, so he was in, at that time he was about 38 or so. Um, he was getting his life in order, so cost was an issue as well. And straightforward, open flap debridement, and if you look at the middle screen, that's what we achieved just with open flap debridement. Uh, this is obviously three months post-op, patient walks in, he's got the odd little pocket here, there, but doing phenomenally well. Once, once we actually done with uh, the, the, the active phases, that is the initial phase and the surgical phase, patients then go on to a, a maintenance phase or supportive periodontal therapy phase. And this is very, very flexible. Uh, usually patients don't come in every three to four months for, uh, for, for, for consultation. In very stable patients, I would do uh, a comprehensive examination uh, probably uh, once a year. But in patients who are not as stable, at least every six months. And this is also to understand where we are going, because I don't want things to go back to where they were prior to us starting treatment. And voila, look what happens in 2019. And this is us slowly motivating the patient. Block control. Do this. Do that. And the pictures you see on the screen are really impressive. This is, if you go back to the first uh, sc uh, screen uh, with the, with the x-rays, this mouth was an absolute mess. And just with uh, non-invasive treatment or non-surgical treatment, as in root planing, scaling and root planing, straightforward open flap debridement, and, and constant nagging, constant nagging, constant follow-ups. Um, you'll find uh, each time the patient walks in, the plaque levels up, we go back, we look at where the problem areas are, we re-educate, and then we, we carry on from there. And with time, you find things start getting better. I'm showing this to you because most of the time uh, when we are at university or starting to become dentists, it's not about what happens to the patient. It's about what quota do I need and how do I get this quota? So we're not seeing the changes that occurs due to our intervention. We more worry about getting this quota and moving on to the next year. Now, in the real life practice, this is what happens. It doesn't happen in, in six months. Obviously, I'm showing you cases that are a little bit more difficult to manage. We have straightforward cases. We bring them in there, we clean them out, and everything is fantastic. This took nearly four years to get to a point where the assessment that we did resulted in zero pockets. Unfortunately, it did not last that long. Uh, come 2020, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, everything has gone crazy. Uh, the patient was actually, the patient has been through a lot uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. He lost two very, very close family members. And you can start to see changes in the middle, um, uh, what do you call it, the middle uh, evaluation sheet, where the, the pockets have increased slightly. We got him back. We managed him again. We focus on blood control. And look what happened uh, at the very last assessment, which is on your extreme right-hand side of your screen. Again, he's improved. So it's constant communication. It's constant interaction. And it takes years to keep this patient stable. 
And look, there are patients where all the time you get the odd pocket uh, pitching up, but it's about attending to that. So in, in cases where patients would walk in for an assessment and we pick up one formal in the pocket, we we'll actually clean that out at the time of scale and polish. We're not going to rebook them for a root planing. It's actually just not fair. What I'm trying to point out is, guys, if you have patients whom you're managing with periodontal disease, it requires time, it requires patience, and you need to get this message across to your patients as well. I know we're running out of time. I have one more case to talk about, and then we're done for this evening. So, why I want to bring up this case is because it's a mixed dentition. It's natural teeth as well as dental implants. So when we first saw this patient, he had those implants in his mouth for about 10 years. And strangely enough, if you look in the 47 side, the bottom right-hand side, there's a new implant sitting in there. And no thought was given to whether this mouth is healthy or not. The most important thing was, let's put the implant in. Yet, if you look at the other implants that are there, there's periimplantitis, there's bone loss. The big issue we have in this particular case are the implants in the second quadrant. They are placed quite close to each other. And look, access is okay because we've now got some bone loss. At the time when they are placed, the patient said he, could, he couldn't get in there, he couldn't clean well. So let's look at this patient. He's got a pretty high bleeding profile at the initial uh, assessment. At that point, as you can see, we did not do a plaque index. It was done later on. Uh, his, his biggest issue were, uh, were basically uh, teeth in the upper jaw. Uh, most of them had some degree of disease association. From probably the 1.8 to the 2.2, two, two, there were severe involvements or areas of severe disease. And as we followed the patient through, so we did a similar thing for this patient. We brought him in, we took him through the, the root planing sequence, and the first uh, chart on the top left-hand side indicates the improvement that we achieved just with scaling and root planing, and obviously plaque control instructions. The middle chart is a chart that was, uh, was three months post-surgery. So uh, he, he came in for the initial phase of therapy, we then uh, reassessed, decided that he needs to go to for the surgical route, did a bit of surgery. In this case, we did do a little bit of regeneration. Uh, the combination of bone we used was by os and cadaver bone, uh, or bone grafting rather. And what you're seeing there, it's a three-month post-op, which is fantastic. Uh, and then your extreme right uh, evaluation sheet shows this trend of improvement continuing. Mind you, if you look at the plaque levels as we are going through, they are relatively high. And we have been fighting, say fighting, fighting the plaque. Uh, we're trying to get the patient to clean effectively to fight the plaque. And it's been very, very difficult. And then in late 2019, somewhere around there, uh, this is how he presented. I think this was his best moment. Uh, he still had three little pockets uh, in, uh, in his mouth, but. Generally, his hygiene was good. Plaque again, I say good, good within reason. It is still very, very high, but the mouth was responding quite nicely. And this was 2019, just before COVID. We last saw the patient in 2020, and strangely enough, all hell broke loose. The number of pockets increased. In fact, if you're looking at that 42, you suddenly got a deep area there. And the question mark is that, he was in pain uh, on that 42, and that's the reason why he sought treatment. If it was not for the pain, he would never have come in. He was then booked in for a cleaning, so on and so forth, and he's never returned, uh, simply because it was a COVID thing and he's not comfortable. He's an uh, elder, older gentleman. So what I'm getting at, guys, is when you are managing your patients with periodontitis, you need to be on top of it all the time. You need to commit time, energy, and effort and it's a slow process. And you've got to tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until eventually everything falls in place. So what can I leave you with today? First of all, you need to understand gingivitis is reversible. Periodontitis is generally painless, especially in the early stages. And we need to know that early diagnosis is far more favorable. You need to address the risk factors, smoking, obesity, um, Mental health issues. Ongoing maintenance is a must. And the most important of all things, understand your limitations. 
if you're a practice that's only involved in, uh, in Cowan and Bridgewood, for example, which is a different kind of thought process, suddenly you put this patient in there who's got chronic periodontal disease, it requires a bit of a mind change. If you find it doesn't fit in your practice, refer out. But plan your case and understand your limitations. And I once again want to thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Jadwit, for a, such a, a wonderful, motivating and practical session. Um, I hand over to Dr. Ntabi Singh Metsing, who will um, do the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Dr. Baker, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jadwit. Uh, it's always very interesting to, to listen to your talks. And as Dr. Baker has said, very practical uh, presentation session. Um, we've got about 20 questions, so hopefully uh, we don't run out of time. So the first question is from one of our anonymous attendees who wants to know, what can we do to enhance a favorable microbiome by way of probiotic supplementation or prebiotic augmentation? It's a very interesting question. So I'm going to kind of be a more of a gray answer rather than a black and white answer. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with bacteria that are opportunistic. Okay? The fact that we don't have disease every day and everyone out there does not have disease, considering that we have found like 700 different species of bugs that live in our mouth, is very simple. These bugs are competing for two things, food and space. And as long as that, that, that harmonious competition goes on, everything will be made stable and I'm out. What we can do is actually change the environment. That's my opinion, rather than looking at supplementation, because if you look at why do we carry out surgery, we carry out surgery to change the environment. If we reduce that pocket depth from seven millimeters to three millimeters, suddenly you have oxygen in there. Suddenly the anaerobic bacteria cannot thrive. So I would rather put my, my, my eggs in the basket saying, spend more time on effective flock control rather than, rather than worrying about uh, prebiotic and probiotic augmentations. I find a simple thing as cleaning effectively can make a massive difference. Obviously, I'm talking about in a sense where there is no smoking issues or mental health issues. I'm talking about a, a patient purely periodontitis and has poor hygiene. Thank you, Dr. Jadwit. Uh, clearly these microorganisms are living like us humans. I mean, we're also competing for food and space. So the next question, what are the most common drugs that are risk factors for periodontitis? So I, I've been through the whole list that I was going through earlier on. It's actually, the, remember, you're starting off from gingivitis. So you, you need to first tackle that. Once you get to periodontitis, too late. The, the drugs are just aggravating if they are. So uh, decongestions, drugs that would dry up the mouth, that would, would cause dehydration in the mouth, all these kind of things can aggravate. But what about the drugs that cause gingival overgrowth? It can also affect your effective block cleaning. So in, in, in effect, you end up with gingival overgrowth, you can't clean, and eventually get pocket formation and breakdown as well. So there's a whole list. Uh, this is too much to go through. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jacqueline. Does wearing a mask cause an imbalance in oral flora and could this lead to oral thrush? So this is actually quite an interesting question. Of recent, we've been getting quite a few cases where patients are complaining about discomfort on their tongue or discomfort on their mouth. And I've been doing my own little in-home in study to see whether it's a mask that's causing it. Personally, I find when I'm wearing the KM95 mask, I start to mouth breathe. And when I start to mouth breathe, I, I dehydrate. So yes, I, I would, does wearing a mask, I would be more specific depending on what kind of mask you're wearing, but I do think it has a fundamental impact because I find it happening in myself as well. 
And it would be interesting to know, especially during the times that we're living in, where we have to wear a mask at all times. So it would be a very interesting uh, something to know. Um, it, it, it is very funny. Sorry, I'm cutting you off. It is very funny. You know how I figured this out? So I still have my braces in my mouth and I've got elastics in my mouth. And the one evening I got, I got home and I felt this pain in my thumb. What the hell is going on? Meanwhile, because I'm breathing through my mouth and my tongue is moving on to the elastic, I actually bruise the entire side of my tongue. So I realized you know, subconsciously, I'm actually doing this while I'm working on my patient. I'm so focused on the patient, I forget about what I'm doing under my mask. So I think we're all guilty of that. Uh, with regard to, sorry, the, the, the question know. about uh, can a mask There's aggravate? A yes, periodontal conditions. So, so drying out the mouth will most definitely affect the mouth. And wearing a mask, like I said, the KN95, I get very, very dry. So you've got existing disease and you've got a dry mouth, just adding fuel to the fire. All right. Okay, the next question. Does the, gra the, does the gut micro microbiome play a part in the overall oral health status of the patient? If yes, does the role of the gut microbiome supersede the part played by the oral microflora in periodontal health? Mouthful. I know. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to answer this question. So, okay, let's start from the obvious, right? We're starting off on the mouth. We have a selected amount of bacteria, uh, which we do know exist in the mouth. As we go down this little tube, things start to change. Right. And different bits have different pros and cons, different uses and advantages and disadvantages. So I actually don't have a good answer for you. I'm, I'm just going on the spur of the moment kind of thing, whoever is asked to answer. I do apologize. I can check up for you and get back to you on this one here. Uh, look, the, the short answer would be yes. The long answer, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense, Dr. Because <laughs> the, the, the microbiome will play a role in oral health status because if they're causing disease and they're not causing disease. So I, that part I have to agree with, right? But we go to the gut microbi uh, microbiome. I don't think it was, remember, it's a different kind of bacteria and, and it can cause Part of the answer is yes, and part is, I don't think so. Thanks, Doc. And uh, the next question is asking about the cost of periodontal bone graft and what is the success rate? It's been a wonderful evening. Nice chatting to you guys. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, <laughs> look, it's a difficult Ooh. question to answer. It's a difficult question because we talk about bone graft, right? Uh, what kind of graft material are we going to be using in that case? Is it going to be a xenograft? Uh, is it going to be a cadaver bone? Is it going to be a synthetic bone? So all these things will make a difference. That's the first thing. Uh, success rate, uh, when you're looking at, at, at grafting uh, areas, the most ideal, going back to pure textbook stuff, would be a three-wall defect. And it makes a lot more sense because three-wall defect means blood supply coming from all three sides. You've got uh, new cells being generated from that area. So it will provide the, the best success. Whereas a two wall slightly less success and then a one wall a lot less. Um, what I wanna add is that it's become a little bit easier for us to determine whether we can get something decent going or not. In the good old days, we would do periapicals and we would tell the patient, listen, when we go in there, when we open everything up and when we look, we can tell you yes or no, we can graft or we can't graft. With the advent of the CVCTs, it has taken a little bit of guesswork out of it. So, you know, we can have an idea of what the, the actual anatomy of the defect looks like before we get in there and whether it's actually worth our while to do some grafting or not. Um, cost, like I said, would depend on what material we use. Uh, with regard to outcomes, if you use it in the right place, we generally get really good outcomes. Thank you, Doc. And then the next question, I don't know if you're familiar with the story that's doing the rounds, uh, Ronaldo pushing the Coca-Cola bottles away. So um, our practitioner had a patient who was asking about that and the patient wanted to know 
if you if the practitioner or but in this case do you think that he did the right thing implying the adverse infect, uh, effects of coca-cola on general health and on periodontal health the patient also further asked what about all the other junk foods that we eat the effects thereof i suppose what should we have told the, what should the practitioner have told the, the patient regarding these two questions I was more interested in what happened to Coca-Cola share price. Do you know it dropped after that comment? <laughs> it, it, it does not cause a big stir. So it, the business part interests me. Look, it's, when you say Coke, I'm assuming sugared Coke, the normal uh, original Coke, and not, not, not the, 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 uh, the sugar-free versions, or the low sugar versions. It has a tremendous amount of sugar in there. It is, it is carbonated. The whole thing together, mm. healthy drink. So to ask whether it's of benefit or not, it's of no benefit. And I, I'm, I'm very pro what Ronaldo did. Uh, we need to go to healthy drinks. And believe me, the safest, healthiest thing is water. That is my go-to. I have a uh, five <laughs> if I go to bed at night, I feel good. I feel hydrated. Uh, and try, try stopping cool drinks for a while. Try stopping the, the gassy bits and see how good you feel. So... I'm totally f against uh, fuzzy drinks. I, I, it does not mean I don't have them. Don't get me wrong. I do. I do spoil myself on occasion, but I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, the question regarding junk food. So food becomes junk if we eat it all the time. If I have junk food once a month, once a week, I don't think it's a problem. But if I'm doing it every day, then I think it's a problem. So that's what you need to tell your patient. It only becomes junk food if you abuse it. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. And I think the next question is tied into what you've just responded to. So does a high carbohydrate rich uh, diet contribute to periodontal disease? What about a highly refined carbohydrate rich diet? So I think you've kind of touched on that one as well. I just add a little bit more to it. It's actually a very good question. So if you recall, I mentioned that the periodontal pathogens are anaerobic bacteria. So they live in a non-oxygen environment. Most of the, of, of the bacteria living on the surfaces of our teeth that are exposed to the oral environment uh, tend to get their energy source from a carbohydrate-rich diet, uh, diet, whereas the periodontal pathogens, because they're living in non-oxygen environments, they can't actually derive... Uh, the food source from carbohydrates. But what happens is if they release toxins, which cause a bit of breakdown in the surrounding tissue in that pocket. And that's what they normally use in NG source. So with regard to does a high carbohydrate diet contribute to periodontal disease? Not really. It's more, the, uh, they contribute to more plaque accumulation on the surface of teeth. But those bugs in the, in the pocket don't depend on carbohydrates. But it, uh, inevitably, if you're going to have a high carbohydrate diet, you're going to end up with cavities. So, you know, it may, yeah. and, and that can then lead to, you know, cavities in, in a gingival area, uh, block accumulation, food accumulation. So I'm giving you both sides of that. Okay. Thank you, Doc. And I think the next question came in just before you spoke about uh, your slide on root planning. So the member wants to find out the purpose of root planning besides uh, removing valuable cementum uh, layer. And uh, yeah, they would like to know what is the actual benefit of doing root planning? Oh, it's actually a very nice question. So reading the question that they have there, root planning is not designed to to damage. Uh, I get a feeling that the, the question is, why are we damaging uh, a healthy tooth? Mm -hmm. so now, just by brushing your teeth, you can brush the cementum layer right off. So you don't need a, a curette to remove cementum. Right? So what we're left with is basically dentine in most instances. And then you've got this little plaque layer and calculus here forming. You've got bacteria releasing toxins you do get some mild penetration into the root surface as well. So the whole idea of root planing, it's, it's a carpentry term. Planing is to smoothen out, to clean out. What are we doing? We're cleaning out the root surface. We're trying to get rid of what? The bacteria, the, the associated toxins. 
And I, I can't see how that can be harmful uh, because by leaving them in there, you, you may not have the bacteria, but you're not gonna have a tooth either. <laughs> Okay, thank you. If there is a link between periodontitis and systemic disease, such as diabetes, then surely it should follow that our uh, edentulous patients would be at less risk from such a disease, diabetes. At less risk of diabetes or maybe an improvement in diabetes? Because I'm not saying periodontitis prevents diabetes. I don't, that and I don't mm -hmm. think any scientific article is saying that. But I can tell you this much, and I've seen it on my own patients. Uh, I, I go back a few years ago where we had an elderly woman that came to see us and uh, she was diabetic. She actually lost uh, most of her lower teeth because of periodontal disease. They're mobile and eventually she lost them. Most, uh, the upper teeth were kind of okay. Okay, as in we could kind of build up a whole structure for her with above bridge work, current bridge work, and we're okay over there. But in the bottom, we removed everything. Um, put in implants. And this is one of the patients that came back and said, I have a problem. So when we have a problem, she says, uh, I'm feeling dizzy when I'm having my insulin. I'm not feeling good. And what we found was uh, exactly typical, the textbook they tell you that your requirements decrease. So it was, we got a little a live patient where the requirements or medication requirements has decreased. Um, this is a long-term thing. I can't say because obviously at some point we lost contact with the patient, but yes, there's a definite improvement. Mm -hmm. And the next attendee would like to know what is meant by regenerative procedures, regenerative procedures. So we're all aware when, when you've got disease, we've got breakdown of what? We've got breakdown of ligament, uh, bone, cementum, that whole area breaks down. Right? So when you're regenerating, you're trying to reform those elements. There are certain things that we can, certain biologic materials that we can use. Uh, one that comes to mind, for example, is endogane, and it has amelogens and amelogenins in it, and it's trying to mimic the biologic process that happened when the tooth bud was forming. Uh, so we, we're going back in time. You know, we're taking you back to when you were two years old, one and a half years old, and we're trying to regenerate that. The ligament space around our tooth consist of stem cells. So if we can stimulate the stem cell, differentiate into what we want, we can then build what has been lost. Thank you, Doc. Um, which oral mouth rinse would you recommend for adult periodontitis? Is, this still, is it still uh, chlorhexidine gluconate containing solution? <sighs> okay. I actually won't recommend a mouthwash just like that. There has to be a reason for a mouthwash. I'm not a big fan of use this mouthwash and use that mouth. We are dentists in, in theory, and in order to get medication to the mouth, the most effective way would be a mouthwash. If I'm a dermatologist, I'll give you a cream. So there's a time and place to use a mouthwash. Uh, I don't advocate continuous use of mouthwash for no apparent reason. Uh, most of the time, using a mouthwash is really ineffective. So let me, let me justify what I'm saying. Earlier on in my presentation, we spoke about plaque and biofilm. Biofilm is a naturally occurring structure and it can be found uh, on a ship's body. If you go and feel a ship underneath the water, it feels slimy. Above the water, it feels dry. So here you've got this biofilm forming on a hard surface in an aqueous environment. Like we have a biofilm forming on our teeth, which is a hard surface, in an aqueous environment. The biofilm is actually designed to protect whatever lives within it. So if you're gonna throw a mouthwash at a mouth that's not clean, you're actually wasting your time. However, if you clean that mouth out and then throw a mouthwash at it, it has a far better effect. So I won't advocate long-term use of mouthwash. Yes, I'm a huge fan of chlorhexidine. I, I am, I, I don't think I'll change it any, anytime soon, but there's a time and place for that. And should a patient brush first and then floss or the other way around? You know, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> and I laugh because my usual answer to patients, well, I went back to my car again. Do you wash the bonnet first or do you wash the roof first? Does it make a difference? 
as long as you wash everything correctly, right? And that was my, that honestly, that was my, my my answer to my patients. And strange enough, when I was preparing this thing, I, I did I was doing a bit of reading, and I came off across an article. I think it was the American Dental Association, where they actually carried out a research as to what is better. So myself, I floss first, and then I brush my teeth. If you're asking why I do that. It's just a mental thing. I feel better in my head after all. You know, I don't want to brush with this wonderful toothpaste and then get all the bits out. I just feel horrible. Strange enough, this paper shows that, don't take it hard, that it's better to flop first, brush after. Thank you, Dr. Jadrit. And um, I think this also brings the analogy that you used about a patient who says they can't brush the next question that I'm going to pose. And they say, I can't brush gently. And the analogy that you gave, one is a patient who says that um, they struggle to floss or they don't like it. It depends on age is an important factor. I have older patients uh, who have dexterity issues, who have eyesight issues. And then we start thinking out of the box. So, for example, if patients are presented in my office and they have multiple missing teeth, Flossing becomes an absolute nightmare because you know it's, it's nice to floss when you've got contacts. Without contact, it jumps up all the time. And then we, in, in those cases, we may change what we advise for patients. So we get uh, something called ribbon floss. So we get it made for us. It's, it's basically gauze uh, that looks like ribbon. And, and that works quite nicely to a, 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 a kind of a, a, a wiping mo a movement. Um, I am a big fan of flossing. It makes a massive difference because those mesial and distal line angles uh, on the tooth surface, you always miss them when you're brushing your teeth. Also remember, the floss by itself does not clean well uh, or effectively interproximally. Interproximally, the surfaces are flat, they're slightly concave. So if your floss is taut around there, that little concavity in the middle part of the tooth isn't really getting clean. So yes, floss has a, a, a role to play, but it's not a, a sufficient you still need the interproximal brushes to get in there and clean that little concavity. And the unfortunate thing is where this little concavity is, especially around molar teeth, the, the soft tissue underneath there is not this wonderful reinforced keratinized tissue. That soft tissue is, uh, is regarded as a call area and this mucosa and it breaks down a lot faster. So flossing is important, but it is important in conjunction. This is my opinion, like I said, uh, with interproximal brushing as well. And collectively, one would get a decent outcome. Uh, if it comes to water irrigators, I truly am not a huge fan uh, if that's meant to replace flossing. Uh, in many of my cases or my patients who are struggling, the water irrigator becomes an adjunct to everything else. Thank you, Dr. Jadrod. Um, I think we're running out of, out of time, but here's a question that I would like to, to pose. Uh, it's one of the attendees actually that has written it, but it's related to an article that I've also been reading recently. Has it been shown that a uh, vegan or vegetarian diet lowers the risk for periodontal disease? The answer I don't know. I, I haven't read the article, I don't know. Uh, I, might, I, I must say though, a while ago, what I found fascinating was uh, we're talking about people who are purely on a fruit diet. There's this whole documentary and I was, and they actually don't clean their teeth, which got my interest because, but it's all the acid in there in the fruit that's actually cleaning the art for them. I was, I was just curious to, to know what kind of enamel that was left over, but too, when it comes to a vegan diet, I, I can't answer it because I actually don't have an answer for you. We've got a couple of compliments, uh, Dr. Jadwit. But in the interest of time, the rest of the questions that are posed, we will submit, we will send them through to you and then send them directly to, to, to the members who have posed these questions. So at this point, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to give your, your last remarks and then hand over back to Dr. Bika. Thank you. Just want to thank everybody for taking time uh, to listen to my, 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 my presentation this evening. And if guys, you know, hang in there. It's not that difficult. There's help at hand if ever anybody needs any help. There's a whole lot of periods in the country. They're all willing to help. Pick up the phone, give us a call, and we're there for you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mithing. Thank you so much for managing the questions. And to our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Jadwit, 
Thank you so much. It was a wonderful evening and uh, very informative. And I hope everyone takes some pearls home. Um, and yes, hope to see you again on our platform sometime. And uh, yes, everybody, uh, this is the end of this evening's uh, CPD event. Stay warm and stay safe. Please um, look after yourselves, look after your families and good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys.